Kim C. of Greg Baroni certainly sends his regrets for not being able to be here this morning. Um, so on his behalf, I'd like to also thank MBTC and the Big Data Committee um, for putting together what promises to be another fantastic program this year. Um, Attain is certainly proud to be among today's sponsors. So I'll offer just a few words about Attain and then uh, introduce William Murray. Uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Attain, Attain is a growing management, technology, and strategy consulting firm based here in Tyson's Corner with a nationwide presence. Now in our eighth year, our team is comprised of about 700 innovative problem solvers who are working to fulfill our mission to disrupt the status quo, change the world, and improve the lives of those we touch. Attain serves the government, education, healthcare, and nonprofit markets, creating value through services and solutions from strategy and digital transformation, including user-centric design, agile development, DevSecOps, and continuous deployment, to cybersecurity, cloud services, business intelligence and analytics, infrastructure management, as well as industry-specific operational expertise. And we're very proud um, to have recently been recognized by Consulting Magazine as both the 2017 fastest growing firm and a 2017 best firm to work for, uh, ranking number eight ahead of some uh, familiar consultancy names that you might have heard of. Uh, so please stop by our, our booth when you have a chance today and we'll be happy to share more about Attain. Um, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's first keynote, William Rue. Bill is CEO and <clears throat> CEO of GE Digital, as well as Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of GE. As the CDO, Bill is responsible for global IT, as well as creating GE's Digital Threat, a next generation system for streamlining design, manufacturing, and support processes. Bill joined GE in 2011 to establish its industrial internet strategy and to lead the convergence of the physical and digital worlds within GE globally. In this role, he is focused on building out advanced software and analytics capabilities, as well as driving the global strategy, operations, and portfolio of software services across of all of GE's businesses. During his tenure, he has led the charge to develop the first cloud-based platform for the industrial world. He also played an instrumental role in establishing the Industrial Internet Consortium by bringing together government, academia, and industry leaders for setting standards, best practices, and processes for the industrial internet. Prior to joining GE, Bill was vice president at Cisco, where he held global responsibility for developing advanced services and solutions, and has held executive man management positions at Software AG, the advisory board, the MITRE Corporation, and Concept5 Technology. Bill is an accomplished author and a frequent speaker on such topics as emerging business models, cloud computing, analytics, mobile computing, agile development, large-scale distributed systems, and M2M communications. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science from California State University, Fullerton. Please help me to welcome Bill Burrow. Uh, this is on. That's great. Thank you very much. So, um, so to, uh, I joined GE seven years ago from Cisco uh, in that very kind uh, introduction, uh, and on uh, March 1st of 2011, and at the time, I think GE was uh, beginning to realize that their future uh, was going to be heavily based on not so much just the physical services around the machines they sell, but how to take the data that came off those machines and use them in new and interesting ways. And that really was where the company started, is what could they do with the data uh, to be at the leading edge. And I think the way we originally talked about it is, if we don't understand our products better than anyone else, shame on us, because sooner or later someone else was going to take that data and utilize it to bring new kinds of services out. And so the idea was to get started on this without, I would say, a lot of structure or understanding what was going to happen. 
And over that time, I'll explain to you how this is rolled out. But really, what I want to talk to you about is, uh, at first, I want to just lay out four things we've learned about the market that we think are important, and we really talk to our customers about what is happening and how they have to think about where they're going. And the second thing I'm going to do is just talk about the four things we've kind of learned about what does it take to apply this as an organization, whether you're just going to use it inside your organization to drive what you do and how you do it, or whether you're actually going to bring products to market. And we've done both of these things. And we think, uh, you know, other than governments, everyone is going to do both. They're going to use it inside, and then they're going to rethink their entire portfolio over time, or someone's going to rethink it for them. Uh, is another way to look at it. So, you know, the first thing, you know, I would uh, start with is this, that at one time, I think people thought digital was really meant for, let's say, just for Silicon Valley, and in many ways, just for um, the, uh, let's say, media, entertainment, the consumer businesses. And it, it really is, uh, it is a trend that's gonna continue into every uh, business, and we think is going to be the center point of value creation in the industrial world, uh, in, in, in every, uh, changing in every way possible. Not just in, let's say, retail, or telco, or entertainment, and so on. So, but there are things we can learn from that. And I think there are important things to learn because one of the things we learned is that the fact is that most of the existing businesses in these areas, they actually did not uh, recognize this digital shift. And as a result, they open the door for others to take advantage and to undermine them, to disrupt them. The good news is that from an industrial perspective, we don't have to have that happen because we've got plenty of examples out there and we can take advantage of that and not allow ourselves to be disrupted. And I think from a GE perspective, we certainly want to make sure we're delivering these services for the power industry, the healthcare industry, and uh, aviation and so on, uh, and not let that just be left to new uh, entrants who come in and, and take advantage of that. So what we did is said, okay, well, what can we learn from the dominoes that have fallen in order that we can predict what's gonna happen with the dominoes um, that, are, that are happening uh, in the future? And uh, what we discovered is that really, in our view, the four things we can learn in terms of what happened in these other industries and why an Uber could be more successful than a taxi company or an Airbnb could be more successful than a hotel company in creating these new kinds of markets is a couple of things. One is, what's very interesting in these markets is that you can take almost any of these companies and realize that what they did is they took an asset, and Uber's the easiest example, right? They took the idea of a taxi asset and they just made it more efficient. And uh, in fact, what uh, is true in almost all these cases, you can begin to see, that's what most of these companies have done. And even if you go all the way back to Google, uh, you can look at Google in a different way. They took advertising and delivered it more efficiently using search as the mechanism. So for advertising companies with other mechanisms, this, uh, uh, this just overtook them. Even if you take Apple, you know, Apple makes a significant amount of its money on other people's assets, on other people's software. They just managed to come with a delivery vehicle, the app store and the, the phone and so on, that allowed that delivery, be, delivery to be much more efficient. And as a result, every digital company figures out how to take an asset, make it more efficient, and they don't even have to own the asset, in fact, to be the owner of the, the largest set of, uh, of, of wealth in that. So the idea of taking an asset and making it more efficient is at the center point, we think, of what makes these digital companies successful. They wouldn't necessarily describe it that way, but that's how we would look at it. The second thing is they develop a compelling user experience that is often at the center point, even if the capability isn't as good, that experience matters a lot. And most existing companies actually are not very good at that. Uh, and even at the beginning, most of these, these companies aren't very good, but they figure it out. They also know how to open an ecosystem for others to participate, therefore creating much more value for themselves. And they, they allow that ecosystem to grow with them. And lastly, uh, I think software is at the center point of value creation. 
So if you look at that and you say, I'm an industrial company, do I have any of these capabilities? The only thing I can say is an industrial company, we have assets, we sell assets, we help our customers manage those assets. What if someone else figured out how to make a power plant more efficient? Would they need our services? Would they need our products as much? Probably not. And even though they may love us in the power industry, they probably would say, hey, we'll, we'll take whoever will come in and tell us how to drive greater efficiency out of our power plant. If you'll give me two to 3% of your efficiency on my power plant, I'm gonna work with you. So whoever makes those assets more efficient in this way, we think is gonna create the greatest value of the long haul. So that's really at the center point. And you can look at the automotive industry as the first or the next domino to fall. And I just want you to think about what's happening in the auto industry today is we've got two transformations taking place simultaneously, one in electrification and one in autonomous driving. And if you think about the autonomous driving, it probably is going to have even more impact than the electrification. And that autonomous driving, at the center point of it, is all the things we just mentioned. Whoever is the one who, who figures out how to do the software for autonomous driving with a great user experience, is probably going to own that automotive market. Now the good news is, is while you had, uh, I think, uh, Google who really created this concept in many ways, along with the Defense Department, you begin to realize that uh, a GM, for example, has come an enormous way in beginning to be a, a, a leader in this area. So what we're seeing is that the future of digital is not left to just new startups. They will play a strong role. They can win it. But the fact is every company in every industry is waking up to this. And you can see this because they're all off hiring chief digital officers and things like this. And this may be the most important concept to get is that this is gonna happen over the next 10 years and you're either gonna participate or be participated to is another way to look at it. So let's talk about the industrial world. This is the one I care about a lot. And uh, when we started seven years ago, most of our customers and people said, why are you doing this? You know, digital doesn't have anything to do with this industrial world. And now what we're seeing is that just about everyone in the industrial world is waking up to this and it's a center point of how fast can we get there. And the World Economic Forum uh, last year did a very interesting report on a variety of industrial businesses to say, well, what is this idea of IoT mean? What is, what is happening in this market? What's the value of this? And we were, we were completely stunned by how they looked at the value, but it, the, the, just the idea that there's uh, $6.8 trillion of value creation here, meaning somebody is making $6.8 trillion selling products and services in these markets, and there's gonna be a new set of people selling products and mostly services in this market who are going to be at the center point of that value creation, or some that's gonna turn into a value the power producers, et cetera, will get is what's going to happen in digital in the industrial world. So it is a larger market than even the consumer market is uh, for digitization. And just one area in that report is this idea of, of just taking um, assets, taking machines, and making them more productive, and that is a $700 million a year, uh, a $700 billion a year opportunity. And um, so when you look under the covers, what is this idea? What's under that 700 billion is sort of the three sexiest words to an industrialist is zero unscheduled downtime, right? That idea of zero unscheduled downtime on any machine in a power plant or in the aviation industry is what that 700 billion is worth. The thing I'd say though, the other thing we're learning out of this is that customers don't just want, you know, the idea of IoT isn't just connecting. And the, the, the idea of connection is boring. It's the idea of getting value out of these things. So the, when you go talk to industrialists, they don't want to be social, they don't want to be cool, they want to make more money or save more money. And the journey they think about is this. They think about, okay, if you can make my machines more productive, that's great. Zero on schedule downtime, I love that, $700 billion. Where's the 6.8 trillion? Is once you've done that, it's rethinking the operations and then moving into business innovation, helping them rethink how they deliver their products and services. And a good example of this is in the power industry, how they charge uh, and who charges for power is gonna change uh, over the next couple of decades. Uh, and that idea of business innovation and being able to have software manage uh, the charging and billing and everything in a new and interesting way 
is that business innovation. But this is really the second thing we learned, is the journey is gonna be get control of your assets, move into an operations, and then begin to think about rethinking business innovation. Think about the, uh, the driverless car. It's gonna be about, first, can I make that car more pr efficient, productive with a driver in it, uh, what they call level three autonomous driving, then I want to begin to think about changing the business model of that car. Essentially, not selling the car, but selling the service. And when you get down to it, it's a question of who's going to uh, sell the service. Is it the GMs of the world? Or is it the Ubers of the world? And it becomes very fuzzy what the world's going to look like with regard to automotive as you work your way through this. The third thing we've learned out of this is that the, uh, the places we see moving fastest with this, in many cases, is not in, let's say, mature markets. It's almost like the mature markets have so much uh, momentum on the old way of doing business, it's harder to change. What we are seeing is that this is a global phenomenon, and even countries where you would say, oh, they exist on labor arbitrage, automation isn't gonna be the center point, they are moving the fastest. And so these are just examples of industries, uh, you know, that we see changing or um, let's say geographic locations that are rethinking this model from everywhere from the mining industry, which is totally being remade through this, uh, to uh, steel manufacturing, Gerdau out of Brazil is a steel manufacturer, realizing that to be competitive in the future, they're gonna have to rethink this to uh, uh, KTZ is the Kazakhstan rail lines, they're rethinking entirely how they think about delivery, not just as rail, but door to door. And we already see everybody in the world rethinking logistics. Who is gonna move our stuff is gonna change, and how they provide that service is gonna change. So the, this is the third thing we've really learned. It's a global phenomenon not just a, uh, a phenomenon for mature markets, and in many ways having a lot of infrastructure almost makes it harder to move than easier to move. And so there's opportunities everywhere uh, going on. And the last thing that we've learned is that when you go and take any business, there's a journey that business is gonna go through. And in many ways, we get caught up in the technology of IoT and connection and that, that's not really where these kind of customers really want to have a conversation. They want to have a conversation about how do I rethink my business, how do I change my business, and how do I go on a journey? And every customer we talk about really ends up in this kind of a journey, and they realize that they have to go stepwise in it. And the first thing is, uh, it's not about connectivity, it's connectivity for purpose-driven productivity. Zero unscheduled downtime, or some other uh, something else I'm gonna get out of that connectivity. The technology is what I use, but what I really wanna understand is how do I save money or make money in doing that? But every customer of every sort is gonna really start with some productivity they can get out of making this change into this technology. Then they really wanna to begin to move into this operational area and change the way they think about how they operate, let's say, the power plant. And finally, everything is going to be about uh, innovative and new business models. And if you just, just think about this, the purpose-driven connectivity in the power industry may be, i got renewables I'm connecting on the grid, I've got power plants on the grid, okay, let's think about the idea of how I connect those and just make those machines work more efficient on the grid and stabilize the grid and, and produce the energy. In the operations, I may really think about now that those are on there, how do I connect these grids and, and use, uh, use that in a totally new way to cut my cost and automate more of this work so that I don't have to worry about the, you know, the stability of the grid, etc. but my operations become much more autonomous. Then I get into this idea of prosumers and new business models where uh, consumers who are putting on uh, re renewables can come on the grid, I'll buy that, I'll sell that, I'll have new ways of delivering energy at, at different price points to people, and I may sell uh, certain people it so that they can, have, they can get a sustainability credit, etc. So you look at that, that, that idea of going through this journey and focusing on the outcomes is really going to be at the center point of value. 
So those are the four things we've learned about what does it take to really be in this market. It's a, you know, I think when people get in, they talk about big data, they talk about analytics, they, they'll think about AI, they'll think about uh, IoT, and all that is the technology, the primordial soup that you utilize. But the reality is you've got to decide how you're going to drive an outcome in this market. Very different, by the way, I think, than the consumer market. And think about the consumer market. We've talked about the connected home for how many bazillion years. And the reason it's not connected is there's no outcome anybody really cares about. And until the outcome is figured out, the connected home is sort of, uh, you know, going to be a fantasy. But the thing about these worlds is there's a lot of money to be made in providing even two, three, four percent uh, productivity to any of these industrial uh, processes. So now I want to kind of turn to uh, you know what we see as it takes for companies to go through this transformation. And when we started this, we had a what we would have called a software business. So we had about a two point eight billion dollars software business. It was traditional software business, and we've acquired some traditional software companies. So to, to give you a feel on our traditional software business, G, it's about a three point eight. Uh, billion dollars a year in orders in traditional businesses with really a 0% growth rate. It's, the, the, these older software products are not moving, it's not the future, but they're part and parcel of what we have to deliver. So that is what I would call our, our uh, existing uh, set of software products that we provide around our hardware products. But what we're talking about is shifting into a whole new model, both inside the company to do everything I said, and now to take that forward and uh, sell new things. And I want to talk to you about what we've done. And we did that over the last two years. So we launched our new products in, uh, in February of 2016, and I'll talk a little bit about how that's changed the company and the things we've learned. So the, the first thing I'd say is that you've got to rethink a lot in this new world that the traditional underpinning architecture that you probably were using for your traditional products isn't going to work. So if you're using Waterfall, you're going to find it doesn't work in this digital world. You shouldn't be moving to an agile DevOps environment. Those are what the best companies look like. You're probably going to have to move into a cloud-based environment. And what we found that's different in the industrial world, the edge matters a lot in the industrial world because of real time. So how you manage the edge is probably just as important as this idea of cloud. So what we discovered is the architecture changes, the development changes, everything sort of changes, but we didn't look like that. So you've got to really rethink everything in terms of your architecture, what you're going to do to bring the portfolio to market. The second thing we, we learned is you've got to decide what your portfolio is going to look like, and there's a tremendous number of opportunities, but You've got to find those, and we focus really on two things. We decided to focus on that asset performance management, making machines more efficient and productive, and we decided to focus on service automation. And one of the reasons why is we can do it to ourselves, and then we can do it for our customers. So we learn on ourselves, build out these products, and then take these to market. So for us, our portfolio is really around this, and we have rethought that. And so we have this traditional $3.8 million portfolio, and this new portfolio is really around this idea of connecting machines, connecting people, and making, bring more efficiency in this sort of use of data, analytics, IoT, et cetera, world. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the thoughts about where you should invest and where you shouldn't invest and where you should take advantage of others, because we've, we have learned a lot over the years of what's become commoditized uh, not for the players who are selling it, but for you, you, you can't compete with some, some of the uh, vendors out there who are making huge investments. So you've got to figure out where your investments are going to be. So for us, this has really become a focus of our uh, forward-looking portfolios around us. The other thing we learned is we did all this for ourselves and showed it worked. And customers care a lot about showing that if you can do it for yourself, that is a huge advantage you'd have over anybody else in, in the market. So for us, this, this became the idea of us creating our own portfolio, the, what we would call the predicts powered world. Now one of the things is that there's a tendency to get focused on a lot of things. Well, we could build our own cloud, or we could build our own AI, or things like that. And I think that one thing we've learned is these are becoming rapidly commoditized. Now to the players who provide it, it's not commoditized, but because they're investing. It's just that their investment levels are so high, and 
Now, we, seven years ago, this wasn't quite as clear as it is today. So today you could say, well, you know, any dummy would know that. But the idea that, for example, whether it's Microsoft or Google or Amazon AWS, the, the investments they're making, we're going to ride those because we just can't compete with the amount of money they invest in data centers around the world and cloud and everything else. And this becomes a challenge. If you're going to participate at that level, just the cost of keeping up is uh, very difficult. So for us, we realized these things became commoditized. We'll play with others on this in that stack. The things we focus on for us is our unique data and our domain expertise. And those things, it may be like, well, you're a simpleton, Bill. That's just like what everybody should do. But believe it or not, I think most companies don't actually save their data. They don't even know what their data assets and they're figuring it out. So in our aviation business, I mean, we had a ton of aviation engine data. We would not keep. Now we keep every piece of engine data from 35,000 aircraft engines flying every day around the world, and we monitor them in real time. And that unique data, we don't throw away, and that's a few petabytes a year of just engine data we get. Off the power plants, it's even more than that. So we realized that's ours. We're going to figure out how to utilize that and deliver value to our customer. The second was domain knowledge. You know, I think everyone thinks you can just take AI and put it onto your data and suddenly it's going to tell you something about how to manage your machines better, and it doesn't. And you can do parlor tricks, you can do a little things that are cool, but the reality is the real value is you're going to have to put a lot of domain knowledge on top of that, and if you do, you can highly differentiate yourself. So in the end, how you decide to capture this, we found is very important for companies, and that is at the center point of value. If your value is I'm going to create new AI, you know, analytics, and it doesn't have domain or data, uh, I think you're going to have a hard time competing unless you have a unique group of people that came out that know something, uh, and you own those, that IP in a way that no one else does. So I think that's something to think about, and we've discovered, is how do you partner, where do you partner, and so on, in this value chain is important. I think the other thing we discovered is, for most companies, it's not... Uh, it's not about technology, and I suspect for most of the companies that are here or uh, today, it's what you're going to deliver has to be an outcome. No customer is interested in buying IoT platforms. Uh, when they do, in the end, uh, you know, it's bought by a tech group. They don't get as much value. It's slow. And they begin to question what they're getting. I think you've got to figure out how to turn this into what we think of, you know, as helping our customers get to an outcome or at least an insight. And so collect the information, yes, but an ins you know, we sell insights and outcomes. And that has required us to rethink our sales process. Uh, you know, how we sell and what we sell is changing, what risk we take, and how we package this technology. So for us, this is how we think about going to market. And, um, and so in many cases, what we talk about is not the technology, but we're talking about the guarantees in many cases we're making to our customers. So, you know, if, if, uh, if we talk about BP, it is in offshore oil rigs about getting a 2 to 4% uh, productivity improvement. Now, how we get that with all the technology they care about, but the fact is what they're really buying is you got to show me that I'm going to see that on my offshore equipment for real and so on. Or 25% uh, reduction in service failure and so on. So when you look out there, we found we have to understand our customer's domain problem and talk about that outcome and be able to deliver that outcome. And so now what does that have resulted for us in two years? So we have a $3.8 billion order stream in 2017 off our traditional software, which has primarily been $3.8 billion forever, uh, primarily uh, just a flat uh, business. This business in the last two years, in in the second year, we sold 1.4 billion of this and, uh, and uh, 550 million of revenue. And this is an ongoing service stream for us now. And the other thing we did is we focused on our install base. Uh, may seem simple uh, again. For us, we've started, you know, you can get caught up selling to lots of people everywhere. But focusing on our install base, what does, what, why is that important? Because we've sold to 8% of our install base, the 1.4 billion, which means we still have a lot of install base to go through. And being able to go on our install base means we're focused on our data, our unique domain, things like that. So simple things have a big impact if they're harvested right, we think, in this. But it does require a lot of change, and, uh, 
In a second, I'm going to open for questions. So this is like your time to think of a question. Uh, if you can't, if no one wants to ask questions, I'll ask questions of you. That works for me too. Anything you got, either way, work is fine. That was a joke, so it's okay. It's um, so, so I, I'd say the last thing is every company we talk to is going through change. Right? They're all trying to hire quote digital talent. Mostly, they're not even, you know, what that is, how they organize, whether it's inside the organization, whether it's to create a portfolio. It's probably one of the biggest uh, trends we see going on. And the hardest thing is not the technology. It, in fact, I bet everybody in here in the companies and organizations can probably do just fine from a technology perspective. What we see is the hard things are in changes to leadership, talent, and culture. So when you think about leadership, for us, um, look, you've got to figure out how to take your existing talent and this new talent and bring them together. The idea of doing that is harder than you might imagine, or at least we found it harder. And so the fact is industrial people who are building these jet aircraft engines, when you build a jet aircraft engine, the thing you think about is a waterfall model. Let's face it, you don't want to apply uh, agile development to how you build a jet aircraft engine. So imagine you said, okay, we'll only make 80% of the requirements work, we'll fly it and we'll learn as we go, and if, if it breaks, that's okay, we'll, we'll fix it for the next version. You know, no one's going to buy that jet aircraft engine. So you must apply waterfall, you must have deep testing, you must know all the requirements, you must get it right the first time. There's no way you do it any different. When you come in software and you go into agile development, you build a little test, a little put it out, pivot, learn. You build differently. Even that idea of how you bring two engineering approaches together sounds simple, but it, it's not. And the second thing is what we found. I, I, this one shocked me: is industrial people are great mathematicians. They're usually great at statistics and modeling. And believe it or not, they, I, I, in the early days, they called AI voodoo because they said, look, the only real way you do this is through modeling, simulation, statistics. And uh, the idea of marrying AI techniques with modeling and simulation techniques from two different places is, is where a lot of value is. But how you harness that was a lot harder than we expected. So you've got to have leadership in place to bring in new people, and partner them with the old people and make it work. And leadership is important. And many times, putting a digital leader in doesn't work because the industrial they don't know anything about the industrial. And taking an industrial leader doesn't nothing about digital doesn't work. So what do we often see people do? Is well, we'll put the digital people over here and the industrial people over there. So uh, because we want you know they can go incubate it themselves. Oh great, they can you know I'm just taking and, and separating them out. They don't get any advantage of scale and I put a bureaucracy on them, whether we think we do that or not. So I think this is probably the hardest, is how you bring this into a company from a leadership perspective. How do you incubate this? How do you protect them? At the same time, how do you bring the old, uh, the old guard, who are gonna be the important part of generating revenue for you for a long time, together? The second thing is talent. It's uh, figuring out not only how to acquire digital natives, but then how to migrate your talent uh, so they become digital migrants, meaning the supply chain people in our teams didn't understand how any of this digital technology could help them. If you don't understand AI and you don't understand the power of data, you're not going to rechange your whole supply chain. But if you do understand that, you are. So how do you take a great supply chain leader and get them to see the power of what that means? So that's, that's what a, an Uber did, is they figured out the power of that technology to a process they actually understood taxi process. You know, the ability to do that is where the magic is. So for us, getting the right talent in the right place, having digital natives and digital migrants has been important, and meaningful work matters. So a lot of times you'll hear startups say, well, you'll never hire any talent. The one thing I would say we found is you can hire plenty of great talent if you give them meaningful work. Meaning you have problems that really matter, and you give them great technology to work on, and you pay them fairly. Uh, culture is the hardest part in this. Um, the, you know, the culture we had was a certain industrial culture. 
Digital people come with a totally different mindset, uh, you know, and how you bring these cultures together is can be very, very hard. And making sure that, that there's a, a way to change your culture to be able to take advantage of that. And I think one of the examples of how culture changes, the, the key thing in the industrial world is the way we've always done things is people tell machines what to do. The future is machines are going to tell people what to do. That's what autonomous driving is. That's what we're talking about when machine data comes off and you see a problem and you tell somebody to fix it. That, there's a cultural issue to that. So I'll leave you with one final example of this that is, um, is, is just how human nature and culture, if you don't in, uh, figure out how to change it, you'll get no value out of this. And so we, we had an experiment with a product that we tried that was around uh, bed scheduling in hospitals. Hospitals that have, over, uh, you know, don't have enough capacity to deal with all of the people coming in, and you often hear stories of people waiting 24 hours after an operation to get a bed. I didn't understand that beds are not the same in each hospital. I'm sure with the healthcare people they understand this is much more complicated than you can imagine, and people do this. And we so we ran some experiments with algorithms in this, and um, with a hospital, a well-known hospital that uh, you know had had to figure this out. And so they wanted to go from what I think was something like 78% utilization up to 90%. And they felt through, we felt through the AI we could get there. It turned out we put it in place and nothing changed after 60 days. And, it, and so then we went and said why. And we saw this, by the way, in other industries. It's because the nurses would look and say, if they liked the answer, if it agreed with what they thought, they'd do it. If they disagreed, they said the software doesn't know and they wouldn't do it. And so you end up with the same result. They just felt better about some of the things they were making, the choices they were making. They said, oh yeah, that's right, hey, I feel better about that. No change, so what do you have to do? You go in and you say, okay, we need you to actually believe in what you're seeing. And by the way, it may change because you don't believe that. So we, we did that. We, there was a, a um, uh, an education process about why the choices were being made. It showed them a little more depth so that they could see, oh, that made sense. If I do this, it's holding a resource for this, and by the end, this resource allocation makes more sense. And they got into the 80s fairly quickly doing that. But they could never move it up again, so we said, okay, why? So then we went in and we started observing. And we found this out, that in this case, and I, I say this in general, that you would find that uh, the way they placed it also had a social impact. If they liked the doctor, they would group the doctor's rooms closer. Or at the doctor's request, they might know what the doctor likes and the doctor would get if you like the doctor. You could imagine if you didn't like the doctor, what you might do in terms of putting them in opposite ends of the <laughs> spectrum. And we found that that social part of how they viewed the person, the doctor they're working with, actually does impact with how they would make decisions. And there are certain aspects of social you can't change. And so you have to take that into account in many of these decision-making processes. So when you get to this, this idea of culture place into it, you can automate the hell out of supply chain. But if the processes have a social nature to it, you won't see that change. So these are really important things I think we've learned. And so what I'd like to do now is just open it up for some uh, questions uh, that you have, or I can certainly ask you some hard questions I have. All right, if you have some questions.